my niece is called Abby, one of my two nieces. Uh, she's five years old, and this week she was having a conversation with my brother, who is her dad, because she, at the minute, really enjoys borrowing things from people. Not without asking, but she's really enjoying sort of when she's with her friends, borrowing a toy or borrowing uh, an item of clothing or a costume or something for dressing up. Um, and today, uh, this week, the shoe was on the other foot because she had a friend round and the friend wanted to borrow something from her. And she thought, well, borrowing and lending is, is fun. I enjoy it. So yes, I'll, I'll lend you one of my dresses. She was happy to lend one of her dresses until it was time for the friend to go home. At which point, she was no longer so sure about parting with one of her favorite dresses. And so there were some tears, and she said, no, I'm, I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I, I'm not going to lend my dress to my friend anymore. And my brother, who is a really good dad, he sat down with her, and he, he sort of reminded her that it's important. When we've said we're going to do something, it's important to do it. Um, and, and how much joy her friend will get from borrowing this dress. And so... And so my brother sort of said, we, we are going to lend her, lend her the dress, aren't we? And Abby agreed. <laughs> and then afterwards, there were more tears, and so my brother sat down with her and reminded her of, of why it's a good thing to do. And then he said, and actually, Abby, there's a time in the Bible when Jesus says, it's better to give than to receive. What do you think of that? And she thought for a moment, and she said, Daddy, I don't think that's right. <laughs> Abby was deconstructing her faith. We've been doing this series at the moment, these big claims and big questions about who God is. God is holy. God is good. Is God holy? Is God good? We've been doing this because the truth is that there are all kinds of things that as Christians we, we believe, we say are true, but which we might have doubts and questions about. And we might not have doubts and questions about them, but the world around us certainly does. Abby started to discover a little bit of that this week. I know Jesus says it, but it just doesn't seem true to me. It doesn't seem right. That's one of the reasons that we might start to deconstruct and reconstruct what it is that we believe. But another reason might be because actually we've seen how some of the things that Christians believe, we're looking at it and going, how is that going to contribute well to the world? Or how is that going to be popular in the world today? And so we ask questions of those things. And it is right when we're engaging with the people around us to let those experiences come back to our faith and say, well, actually, what does our faith say about that? So that's what this series has been all about. And today, uh, we're looking at this idea of God is the champion. God is the champion. Here's a few verses in the Bible that, that, that speak to this idea. Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. As I read these verses out, there's a couple more. What does it do in you? How do you feel about this idea of champions and victory and enemies and defeat and battle? Psalm 118, verse 7. The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 to 5 in case we thought it was all Old Testament. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. These words about overcoming and victory and defeat and enemies and champions, battle. I wonder how that makes you feel. I wonder whether you think about that aspect of Christian faith a lot or whether you don't. I wonder whether it's something that's important to you or something that is a little bit niggly for you. I wonder how that makes you feel. I think someone's phone might be reading out the passage. Oh, not a problem. That's to totally fine. Sorry, I thought it was coming from here, and no one from here looked that worried, so I thought they might not be able to hear it. Um, I wonder what that does for you. Because there's a couple of things that might make us question that sort of thing. 
One of which is that if God really is this, this champion, this victor God, why is it that Christians aren't always on the winning side of things? Why is it that there are certain things within society that, that actually Christians aren't on board with but seem to be very popular? Why is it that Christians aren't always in the winning seat in the world around us, if God really is the victor? That might be what some people are thinking, but perhaps there might be more people who are thinking, is this kind of talk really what the world needs these days? This world that's incredibly divided, where everyone's divided into camps, politically, socially, financially, where there's a lot of us and them. You don't have to spend long on social media before you find people who are utterly at odds with one another, where there is nothing but division, nothing seemingly but hate. Is it helpful for us as Christians to then be saying, well, God is the champion, to use that kind of language, and yet the scriptures do? Is it something we should just keep quiet about? Well, if it's in scripture, presumably it's important. So I wonder how all of this makes us feel. And I want to start exploring this by thinking about what kind of champion we are talking about when the Bible describes God as the champion or the victor. What kind of champion are we talking about? And to to explore that, I want to contrast two different kinds of champion. There we go. I've got some visual aids, and uh, I'll put them up on the screen as well. So on the one hand, we've got the tennis champion. Uh, I don't know who the men's Wimbledon champion will be this year. Um, I don't don't know, but someone will be. Today there will be a new, uh, or maybe not new, um, men's Wimbledon champion. On the other hand, you've got the you've got the cricketer, you've got the uh, the the batsman who goes out to the crease. Maybe maybe the team is is very much behind. Uh, Maybe there's a there's a there's a ridiculous number of runs that needs to be needs to be hit, Um, but they make it. They get there. They win the match. What's the difference between these two things? Let's see, uh, feel free to shout out. Differences between the tennis champion and the cricket champion, or between tennis and cricket. Sue put her hand up, which is very polite. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a, apart from doubles, um, this 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 is a sport you play by yourself rather than as a team. Anyone else got any other thoughts about differences between the two? Yes. So, so the so the singles champion does have support behind. Absolutely, yeah. Rod, was that what you were going to say? The ball is harder in cricket, and I'm now realising that the bat is heavier as well. Um, so um, I'm wishing I held had held this in my right hand, but I want to match the slides behind me, so I won't. Um, The thing, one of the things, there's many differences, obviously, between tennis and cricket. You don't have to be an avid sports fan to to realize that. But it is this idea of a tennis player is playing by themselves, whereas a cricket player is playing as part of a team. But it's not just that. Because pretty much any team sport, if you follow the team, then what will happen is the team will be playing, You'll watch them win, maybe. I'll put this tennis racket down for a second because we're talking about cricket for a minute. The, your, your, your cricket team or your football team or your rugby team or whatever it is will, will win while you watch and contribute nothing whatsoever. And you watch and maybe you've got a beer in your hand or maybe you're sipping on a cup of tea at home or maybe you're even in the stands clapping a little bit. But you've contributed nothing, and yet the next day you'll go into work or you'll speak to your neighbor or speak to a friend and you'll say, we won. (laughs) Even if Djokovic wins this afternoon, no one in Serbia is going to be going around saying, we won. They're going to say, he won. This is the difference. Tennis champions, it's a he won sport or a she won sport. In cricket, it's a we won Our team won. And actually, it may only be one member of that team that really pulled the weight, but everyone else gets to claim we are the champions. We won. And I want to suggest the reason I'm laboring this point is that it is so vital 
that we understand what kind of champion it is that God is, and that he is not the lone hero tennis champion who wins for himself. No, he is the captain of the team who wins on behalf, not just of those who are playing alongside, but of anyone and everyone who he's associated with. And that that makes a huge difference to the way that we think about things. I want to look at some verses in a New Testament letter called Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, starting at verse 14. We're going to look at these verses, um, sort of verse by verse as we go through. And we'll come back to this idea of cricket versus tennis and why it makes such a difference. But what we're going to see as we look at these is that Jesus wins on behalf of us. Not for himself, but for us. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 starts with, with, with us. Starts with where we are. Since the children have flesh and blood, children is just talking about people, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Speaks about the situation that people find themselves in. Talk about the power of the one who holds the power of death. Speaking about the devil, the devil who loves our death, who loves our physical death, but loves our spiritual death even more. The devil, our great enemy, who wants us to feel shame, who wants us to believe lies, who wants us to be trapped by fear and by guilt, and will keep pointing us to, the, to, to, to this fact that we are spiritually, by ourselves, hopeless that we cannot do it, that we are not good enough, and we'll constantly be wanting to bring us back to that, to, to, that, to that statement that we're not good enough, that we can't do it. We find ourselves born into this situation where we are broken, where we are flawed, where we can't win the battle for ourselves. And the devil loves to remind us of that and push us to that and claim that it is the only thing that is true. But since we have flesh and blood... He, Jesus, shared in our humanity. He didn't say, oh, that's a predicament that I don't want to get into. He says, no, I'm going to come. He joins team humanity. He says, I'm not just going to win this victory over the devil for myself so that I can know that I'm stronger. He says, no, before I win, before I become the champion, I'm going to make sure I become one of them. I'm going to enter team humanity. That's what we remember at Christmas, isn't it? And then he carries on, the writer here, and free those. So Jesus frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Something that Jesus does, we'll come to what that is in a moment, but something that Jesus does, having entered team humanity, having put on the kit, having put on the uniform and said, I'm associating with this team. If they win, I win. If I win, they win. If I lose, they lose. But he chooses to be part of us first. And then we read that he came to do it to free all of those who would otherwise live in fear of death and slavery, who are, who are held captive to it. Because he has done something, we enjoy the benefits. One of the most famous champions in the Bible is David That famous story of David and Goliath, which I'm sure many will know, but in case you don't know it, it's a story of God's people, the Israelites, and they're facing this huge army that they don't have any hope of defeating, the Philistines, who are coming to completely wipe them out. And they stand no chance, army to army, of of, of winning. But then one of the Philistines, this great huge hulk of a man, Goliath, steps forward and says, if any of you can beat me, can kill me, then we'll decide the war like that. And no one wants to fight him because no one, everyone knows that they can't. And so what happens then, of course, we hear that David, this little boy, comes with his slingshot, refuses the armor, comes and defeats the Goliath. Now often, when that story is talked about by Christians, it's talked about as, as a sort of, if you have the faith that David had, then you too can slay your giants. 
You can be a hero as well. You can be the champion. You can defeat everything that comes against you. That's not what the story is about. Or at least it's not the main thing that the story is about. Because this story, read by the Israelites, told by these Israelites to one another, what they were doing is they were celebrating the fact that David won so that they didn't have to. That's what the story is about. The story is about a champion who comes and fights on behalf of his people, defeats what they could never defeat for themselves through trust in God. Yes, God ultimately is the hero of this story. But that's the story, and that is what Jesus does for us, defeats those enemies that we could never defeat for ourselves. Death, the devil, these are too big for you and me by ourselves, but we are not by ourselves because Jesus came and entered team humanity. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, this is a bit of a weird one, the people that that this is being written to, had a, bit of a, had a bit of an obsession with angels. They kept wanting to make everything about angels. And so the writer is saying, Jesus didn't come to save the angels. He came to save you. He came to save people, descendants of Abraham, a man. And then we read what Jesus actually did. For this reason, he had to be made like them. We've talked about that already. Fully human in every way, part of team humanity in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. What does Jesus do when he enters team humanity? Well, he takes on this role of a great high priest, we're told. And the priest was one of the people who would represent the people to God and God to the people, who would take the sacrifices of the people and take them to God And God would forgive the people, and the priest would come back and declare that forgiveness over the people. He does it for them. He's a representative of the people. And we hear that he made atonement, that word atonement, at-one-ment. That's where the word comes from. That we would become at-one with God because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. That as Jesus died in our place, he won his victory for us, his, him becoming champion so that we might know victory. He won what we could not and gave us what we could not do for ourselves. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Because he's one of us, because he did it for us, He can help us. He can give us that. The very end of the story of David and Goliath doesn't finish with David taking a victory lap and everyone going, oh, how great is David? And it all becoming about David. And isn't David a wonderful champion? And we're fans of David now. No, it ends with the Philistines realizing that their hero has been defeated and turning and running. And then with the Israelites realizing that their hero was run and charging forwards, knowing that because it has been won for them, they can then claim that victory. The devil knows that he has been defeated by Jesus. He has no option but to run, to turn tail and run. Death has been defeated by Jesus, and it no longer has any power or claim over anyone who has trusted in Jesus. Sin your own failure and mine, no longer has the power to condemn us before God because Jesus has taken it from us. He has defeated our enemies for us and we get to charge forward because of that. The kind of champion that God is, this kind of champion, not the other kind, not the one who wins just so that he can feel impressive, this kind of champion, he enters the team. He puts on the kit, he puts on the shirt, he says, I will join the team. He becomes like us. He then wins for us. The rest of the team are hopeless. The rest of the team are rubbish. They can't win for themselves. They're all out for a duck. And then he comes along and he says, right, I guess I better do it for you. And six after six after six, boundary after boundary, and, and, and he does it. He wins. And then... Instead of claiming the victory for himself, he gives that victory to others. He goes to the post-match press conference, and when he's asked about that heroic haul of runs that he won, he says, today's not about me. I did it for the team. I did it for the fans. Like any good sportsman or sportswoman would do, 
Because Jesus didn't win this victory. He didn't die on the cross for himself. He didn't need to. He didn't defeat death for himself. He didn't need to. He didn't conquer the devil for himself. He didn't need to. We needed him to. But the truth is, this isn't the weapon that Jesus uses. It's a bit, it's a bit clunky. It's a bit heavy-handed. It's a bit, it's a bit big. Someone shared with me just earlier on this morning a picture that God has given them. It was a picture of a golden box. And when the box was opened up inside, there were sterile surgical implements and instruments. And as this person sort of sat with this, with this picture, God was saying that he wants to do open heart surgery, that there are things that are in our hearts that he needs to unpick, that he needs to, he, he can, he's able because he's, because he's able, because, because he's already won that victory. There's no, there's no sin in our heart that is too big for him. There's no lie that the devil throws at us and seeps its way into our heart and sits there like a curse hanging over our lives. There's, there's, there's nothing that is so big and so difficult that Jesus can't undo it, that he doesn't have the right instruments for. Specifically, there was picture around, uh, words around lies that have sunk in and taken in that place in our lives and, and also past relationships that still have that kind of tie, that, that thing that needs to be broken. And Jesus has the tools for the job. He's won the tools for the job. And by his spirit, he can do those things. Maybe you need to respond to some of that by asking for prayer in a little bit. Back to tennis. If God wins for himself, if he's a, isn't he impressive because he won God. If that was the kind of God he is, he just wanted to look impressive, look spectacular, be better than all of the other gods that people follow, better than all of the other things in our lives. If he did it for himself, if he won the victory for himself, then the very best Christian response would be, well, I guess if he won, I should try and win too. I follow a winner God, so I guess I better try and fight for my own victory. The other thing about tennis is that any time you let a ball go by, you lose the point. You've got to hit every single thing back. And so if Christians, sometimes we can get into this mindset of, well, our God is a winner, so therefore we need to always be the winner in every argument. We need to win the culture wars. We need to make sure that it's only Christians who are in government. We need to make sure that every single thing that we believe, everyone follows. And until that has happened, we haven't got full victory. We can breathe out a little bit because we don't have to win. He's already done it. He's already won. We don't have to win every single debate in our culture. We don't have to make everyone behave the way that we think might be best. Is it important to speak up about issues? Yes, but never from the point of view where we're thinking we need to beat people. We need to win every argument. I love winning an argument. It's one of the most ugly things about me. <laughs> but it can also be one of the ugliest things about Christians in the church. That we have to always have our say, have to always be right. Jesus has won for us. It's not to say we never speak up. It's not to say we don't have our voice heard, but sometimes we can have the reputation because it's true. That we think our voice counts for more than others. And actually, we're not interested in winning the argument. We're just interested in beating them, whoever they are. That's tennis. That's having to win every point for ourselves. Because that's not the kind of God we follow. Because this is the kind of God we follow. The one who won on our behalf while we were sat in the pavilion, realizing that we were out for a duck and all we can do is drink tea and hope. Because that's the God we follow. We just get to claim the victory that he's already given us. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to win it. We just receive it. That's the kind of God we follow. And that means a few things for us. One is, we don't have to battle our enemies on our own. As Christians, it's not that we don't have enemies. The devil is still our enemy. Death is still a reality. Sin will still be part of our lives. But we don't have to fight them by ourselves. 
We need to look to our captain. Ask him for his help by his spirit. He's already done it. He's already proven that he can. Maybe there are particular battles you are facing with one of those things. Maybe there's been spiritual attack for you and you need to stand in what Jesus has done. Let us stand with you in that. Maybe there's an area in your life that you know is not right, that you know is sinful. Don't stand against that in your own strength. You might not win. Jesus can win. Second thing it might mean for us is that we don't have to fight every battle. In cricket, occasionally, you let one past, and that's fine. We don't always have to be right, don't always have to have the last word. If something isn't right, isn't just, isn't good, one day, Jesus will put that right. Again, it's not to say that we never speak up, not to say that we never raise our voice. But here's the third thing. When we do, we're doing it not just so that we can win, not so that we can have supremacy, not so that we can be the best or be the strongest or be the most popular. We do it because we're fighting for people. That's why Jesus came. That's why he entered team humanity. That's why he picked up the bat and win the, won the points that we couldn't win. He did it for us. Christians should be known most for the people that we are for, not the issues that we are against. The world is so divided politically, pro-choice, pro-life, Republican, Democrat, Labour, Conservative, even within political parties. That there's so much division that we can find around us. It's not to say that we never pick a side. It's that we're not fighting against people. They are not our enemies. They're part of team humanity as well, and Jesus came for them. So I wonder how you need to respond today. I wonder how it is that you need to claim that victory that Jesus has won for us. Do you need to rest and stop fighting for a bit? Is there an argument you just need to not have to win? Do you need to stop trying to prove yourself? Is there an area of your life that you know Jesus wants you to walk in greater victory? Because it could look as though you're losing at that bit. You've been maybe trying too hard to fight it, but he just wants to come and support you. Do that with you, do that for you. Maybe you need some open heart surgery. Maybe there are things in your heart that have got lodged there. Lies that you've been carrying for far too long. Relationships that have had their toll that aren't there anymore, but the effects still are. Maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you need healing. He can do that too. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't have power to do and power over. So I'm going to pray and invite Stuart and the band to come back and lead us. I'm also going to ask those who are serving on the prayer team today to come and dot around at the sides. Whatever it is that you need to respond to today, I know it's hot. I know it's sticky. I'm probably the hottest and stickiest in the room at the moment. But let's not waste this opportunity to seek God for more and more of that victory in our lives. Not so that we can become arrogant and proud and put others in our place. But because Jesus wants us to know his victory more and more. Not leading us to arrogance. Leading us to compassion. To be peacemakers. Secure in the knowledge that we are his. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you did what I could not. Thank you that you still do what I cannot. I'm sorry for the times when I have to win. When I think it depends upon me. Thank you that it only ever depends upon you. 
help us to follow in that charge behind you, our captain. We stand against, we stand with you against the devil and every lie that he tells us, every bit of destruction that he wants to bring. We stand with you against our own sin, our own failure. And we ask that you would do that work in each of our hearts that you know needs to be done. To cut out the rot. To fill us with life that will pump into every aspect of our bodies and our being and our lives full of you. Full of life and light and love. We ask all of these things in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Captain and our King. Amen.